Thanks for coming along tonight on this uh, rather cold and wet Sydney evening, but uh, you're here and we have a lot of people on Zoom and others will pick up the broadcast or the television version of the broadcast later on. So a special welcome to the Honourable Keith Pitt, who makes his first personal appearance at the Sydney Institute, and it's great to have him here. Um, we put this on at late notice, and so it's good that we've got so many people here in the room. Now, Keith Pitt will be known to you for his as being a former cabinet minister across a number of ministerial positions in the uh, Morrison government and the Turnbull government, so in the recent coalition government. Member for Hinkler since 2013. Um, he's um, he's an, uh, he has a degree in engineering. He's an, been an electoral fitter mechanic. He's run a sugarcane farm. He's worked in small business in consultancy, so across a whole range of of, um, of, of tasks outside of politics before entering politics in 2013. And tonight, um, Keith Pitt is going to talk for us, who sits, as you know, sits with the Nationals in the LN, in the party room in Canberra, um, in, the co in, in the party room in Canberra, and he's going to talk to us tonight on a topic we've called The People, the Power and the Path to a Better Australia. Keith Pitt, you're very welcome. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, can I thank you firstly for the warm welcome. It's good to be amongst friends and can I, of course, acknowledge Mr Henderson, a stalwart, uh, and this is my first live and in the flesh appearance at the Sydney Institute. I think we did one on Zoom, if I recall correctly. Uh, for any of my previous staff that might be watching who know that I've got a very bad habit of putting the set-piece speech to the side and just talking for 20 minutes, uh, I won't do that. So I feel much more comfortable. I'll stick with the set-piece for now. Ladies and gentlemen, the people, the power, and the path to a better Australia. The greatest glory in living lies not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. So said Nelson Mandela, and his message is one of perseverance. If you're a conservative, if you're someone who fights the socialist agenda, an individual who truly believes in our democracy, who thinks you advance through the sweat of your own brow, not through a reliance on handouts from the state, then it's a message you should hold dear to your hearts. Because there's no doubt the conservative side of politics has been through a few dry gullies recently. In Queensland, the LNP held government for a single term under the Campbell Newman landslide, something which actually motivated me to join a political party. In South Australia, again, a single term, beaten badly in Victoria, belted in Western Australia, and now the people of New South Wales have thrown out probably the most competent state government in the country. Now, adding to this train wreck was, of course, our own defeat in the federal election last year. The cries of move further to the left ring loudly in the streets and in activist rallies, except, of course, for where it matters, at the ballot box, with our people, with the punters in the regions. And yet our parties continue to be hijacked by the progressive agenda. The Conservatives that I talk to the quiet Australians, Tonys, Tradies, Menzies, Forgotten People, the working class poor, the high-vis army, they all tell me the same thing. They are over it. They are over the ludicrous left ideologies, running rampant and threatening their way of life. Sure, everyone can have an opinion, but don't force that wild opinion down their throats, stopping their voices from being heard. They love our country and its flag. They don't care if you come from a foreign shore, whether you were born here or took the oath of citizenship last week, they consider us all Australians from every walk of life. Work hard, play hard, but play fair. They don't think if you've had the advantage of testosterone, you should be playing sport with their mothers, sisters and daughters. They think the DNA doesn't lie and they want to feel safe and be safe in their homes and on the streets. They want to look after the environment, but not at a cost the nation simply can't pay. They want the lights to stay on and to be able to afford to pay that bill. Every now and again, I get accused of being part of the so-called political class, which I actually find, to be honest, hilarious. For a bloke that's common as dirt, that went to a public school, that did a trade, a degree, ran a small business, was a cane farmer, calling me a political careerist, well, that proves they really don't know me at all. And it is that real world life experience and education that makes me look at policy in a different light, a more practical light that I think many Australians value. However, the only way 
conservative politicians can prosecute conservative policies is by winning government. You can't implement a policy agenda from opposition. You may as well try and boil the ocean. Now, going back to Mandela's statement earlier, we've been knocked down, but it is time to get up again. Going into the next election, we need to have a proposition, one which not only resonates, but matters to the Australian people. A plan for the future and an acknowledgement of the past. A plan that is true to our values, with core elements that the Labor Party simply can never go with us on because the Me Too movement extends to politics, as you all know. If there's no differential, the mob just votes for the real thing. Labor Light, the Teals, Shooter Farmers Fishers, Independence, One Nation, a vote for any of them gives you a Labor government, as has been demonstrated in recent years and in a trend which has been ruthlessly exploited by the Labor Party. Now, I believe that the primaries at the last federal election show that for one of the major parties, the jig is up. And that major party is Labor. Their policy positions, their decisions, ultimately how they are governing is of a party for which the old Labor right no longer exists. They are no longer the party of working people and they haven't been for some time. They are the party of the inner city, the university activist and union organisers. They are not even the party of union members, just union bosses. Labor is no longer the party for those who $50 a week means everything. They are the party for those who can afford to be idealists, the feel-good class, because they can afford it. Working people are never going back to Labor because they simply can't afford to. Those days are long gone, like instant coffee over the soy latte. Now, for the Liberal and National parties, I am the first to admit that big chunks of our people have wandered through the open gate, they're over on another hillside, they haven't looked around, but we can win them back through the right policy, by standing by our core values, being courageous and brave and not giving in, by being knocked down but getting back up, by delivery. Now, to do that requires both a proposition and a vision. But what should that proposition be? Well, let's start with energy. Vexed, expensive, divisive, a number of words to describe what's happening with energy policy in this country. Now, as someone who did a trade as an electrician in heavy industry, followed by a degree in electrical engineering, well, to me, it's just not that hard, right? It really is not that hard. Rule one, do things that work. You will never make electricity affordable if you build two generation systems simply because one doesn't work all the time. Rule two, keep your costs as low as possible. And rule three, it's an engineering problem. It is not a social problem. And this is important. You shouldn't be designing critical infrastructure based on the feeling or the vibe. Now, I've spent the last 10 years fighting the madness of intermittent wind and solar at every level. And I'll put some context around why. So ask yourself this question. Would you drive your car filled with your family members over a bridge designed by a political lobbyist, or maybe as a member or a senator, or an activist? None of which have any relevant bridge building qualifications whatsoever. Now they know how to make it sound nice, they can give you a warm feeling, but it puts your family at imminent risk. Now unfortunately, this is where we are at with unqualified vocal lobbyists and activists designing Australia's energy future. So the solution, in my view, is very straightforward. Right now, we should be utilising our existing assets for as long as possible. Coal, gas and traditional hydro. But let's have a look at the government's current energy dreamscape. It is an idealist world built on a feeling. Now, the recent budget isn't getting electricity prices down. Labor decisions are putting taxpayer subsidies up and no matter what spin the spinning top energy minister spins, Labor's policies can only increase costs. They can only increase costs. Labor is not getting prices down. They are literally driving them up. Now, Labor's climate plan is economic suicide for this country. Our competitive edge has always been the fact we are blessed with resources, with smart, hardworking people, and energy costs that are low and competitive. Now, the short version of Labor's plan is this. Two million plus hectares of solar panels, 
And just for some context, keep in mind the entire Australian sugar industry is around 350,000 hectares, like a giant tarpaulin spread across our natural environment. Thousands of wind turbines throughout regional Australia. Well, let's be clear, there is enormous opposition. 10,000 kilometres plus of transmission and those lines running through easements that firstly don't exist, they impact thousands of landholders and they don't want them anywhere near them or their community. And don't forget 3.8 million electric vehicle charges in homes and businesses, none of which is costed and all has to be operational by 2030, less than seven years away. Now, even AEMO says you may require a 60% increase in electricity generation, transmission and distribution capacity. So just think about that for a minute. Every power line, every substation, every cable that provides powers, power to your house has to be upgraded by 60%. So bigger cables, bigger conduits, <coughs> dig up every curb, every footpath, upgrade every single substation and all of the overhead network. And that is without even thinking about the new power stations that will be required. Now, as Paul Broad, former Snowy Hydro, Hydro CEO, I'm sure you've all heard of, recently stated, and given we're a mixed company, I'll paraphrase so it's a little bit more acceptable. <laughs> it is rubbish. It is fairyland stuff. Now, apparently all of these developments will have no delays with environmental approvals, no issues, issues with Aboriginal heritage or hundreds of other permits and approvals that would normally be required. So are they just going to be ticked and flicked? Well, why? because those installations are going to go on cleared and partially cleared agricultural land. Now, for those who might be watching or here that don't believe me, well, you can check out last November's CSIRO report and you can take a drive to any country region where this insanity is spreading. It's very clearly outlined. Now, what is the, uh, the alternative? In my view, it's quite simple. We extend the life of our existing coal assets for as long as possible. We utilise technology, including nuclear technology, as it develops over time. We expand our natural resource opportunities, particularly with the additional development of gas in the Beetaloo, offshore Scarborough, Barossa. We extend our offshore, onshore gas pipelines and infrastructure. Now, the current Energy Minister wants to tell the everyday Australian consumer that federal labour is acting in the world's best interest. That regardless of the fact that Australia contributes only around 1% of the world's emissions, it's Australians that must pay. Pay through higher electricity and gas prices. Pay more for transmission lines. Pay for climate reparations to third world countries. Pay more for cement. Pay more for steel. Pay more for construction costs. Pay more for freight. Pay more for logistics. Pay more for fuel and vehicles, including a six cent increase in diesel for heavy vehicle transport in the last budget. And even though you could close the entire economy tomorrow and it would have no impact on the global temperature, even though emissions are already down by more than 20%, even though Australian manufacturing can't be internationally competitive unless energy in this country is reliable and affordable, even though industry has said they expect as much as a 35% increase in prices and electricity in the next 12 months, even though most solar panels and wind turbine manufacturing will benefit China. Even though China is the big winner, Australians under a Labor government have to pay. Now, these are the things I just don't get. I just don't get it. So, let's get ahead into the sand here. Labor's strategy is the equivalent of walking outside and setting your car on fire because it runs on diesel, even though you still owe 50 grand on it and you're going to have to borrow even more to buy another one. Now, who has the greatest impact? It is the Australians that can't afford to pay. It is them. So, what does the everyday Australian have to say in this conversation? They want to look after the environment. We all do. The question is how much they want to pay and how much do they want our nation placed at risk due to a failure of energy security and a reliance on Chinese manufacturing? Are they willing to have transmission lines, solar panels and wind turbines sprayed all over their backyards? Are they willing to consider the big policy alternatives like nuclear? And the speed of Labor's train wreck is increasing. The Energy Minister wants us to be an intermittent wind and solar super unreliable power. Now most Australians that I know just want the lights to stay on and they want to be able to afford to pay their bills. And an increase in cost for electricity and gas puts up the cost of everything. Everything. Because everything that Labor is proposing costs money and it has to be paid for. 
every pole, every wire, every panel, every tower, every substation, every charger. Most of the intermittent energy sources have a life cycle of 20 years at best, and then you replace them all again and again and again. Which brings me to nuclear. Now, following the AUKUS announcement, the majority of challenges with developing nuclear industry in this country have to be dealt with. They just have to, because necessity is a great motivator. Now, keep in mind the reactor on a Virginia class boat, I'm told, is around the size of a wheelie bin. It will last for 30 plus years without refueling. So, think about that. A reactor the size of a wheelie bin runs for 30 years. And in terms of the current roadblocks, well, Federal Labor has addressed the moratorium on nuclear because you can't build nuclear subs in Adelaide with the current prohibitions in place. A domestic nuclear capability has to be built for AUKUS, including technical capacity. This means training and recruiting the right people. Labor's own statements say 10,000 plus Australians must be ready for recruitment. Nuclear subs will produce high level radioactive waste. So a high level radioactive waste facility is now a necessity. So in the very near future, we could have no moratorium on nuclear, domestic technical capacity, a high level radioactive waste facility. And to be frank, if you can put a reactor in a sophisticated tin can 200 metres under the ocean, then surely, surely you can put one on a block of concrete in one of the most stable continents in the world to provide reliable base load zero emissions power for up to 100 years in which time Labor's wind and solar installations could have to be replaced five times. Now that is assuming, assuming they don't get hit by a bushfire, a flood, a cyclone or a hailstorm. So all that is left is location, location, location. And in my view, this needs to be the coalition's focus. No community should get a nuclear reactor that the majority in the region don't want. You can't build these things where people don't want them. Giving free electricity to those communities is something that you should actively consider, and why not? And if South Korea, Japan, the UAE, France, the UK, and almost everybody else is commencing or expanding their nuclear industry, why on earth wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we? And I know they're out there, and for those howling at the moon on costs, well, let's have a look at some reality. South Korea's most recent build was around 18 billion US for four 1,350 megawatt power stations, four of them. Labor's most recent budget is claiming $40 billion towards their super unreliable power plan, including 20 billion towards just transmission alone. And from everything I've read and seen, that could be as much as $80 billion short, just in transmission. But there is more to winning back voters than just energy. Ladies and gentlemen, on social policy, Australia, we have a problem. It is difficult, it is tough to acknowledge, but it exists. Far too many Australians are caught in multi-generational welfare dependent households, far too many. And far too many never break that cycle, never. Now as part of the cashless debit card trial in my electorate of Hinkler, we analysed the history of Newstart recipients. Now some of the stats from then are very, very sobering. In 2017, when the Hinkler trial site was announced, of those who were under 30 and on welfare, 90% had a parent who was also on welfare during the past 15 years, the majority of whom were on welfare for at least nine of the last 15 years. And this next bit is the kicker. Without any intervention, it was projected that 57% of those under 30 on welfare would still be on income support in 10 years' time. 57% still on support in 10 years. So it was great to see Peter Dutton's commitment to put the cashless debit card back on the coalition's agenda when we win government. And I emphasise it's when, right? It's not if, it's when. And dealing with multi-generational welfare dependents will take tough decisions and commitment from government. Now, while the CDC is just one tool in the toolbox, the cashless debit card works. It's that easy, it works but Labor's idealistic decision to remove the CDC trial sites and prevent further rollout was described by one local as having unleashed chaos. And we have all seen the reports in the media. The voices that Labor listened to were the Socialist Alliance, the Greens, the inner city idealists and the left of their own party. For us, the coalition is listening to the voices of the people that live there, that live in those communities. 
frontline workers, police, teachers and local Aboriginal leaders. Now this is a technology that should absolutely be rolled out nationwide with similar settings as to the trial in my electorate of Hinkler. If you're under 35, you're on Newstart, which is now JobSeeker, Youth Allowance Other and Parenting Payments Partnered or Single, you should be on the CDC if you're receiving those payments. The backroom IT costs are already paid. Testing, the comms, the training, it's done. And it's a commitment that the coalition, in my view, should run hard on at the next election. National rollout of the cashless debit card. Now, just a couple of quick comparisons. Labor is spending $217 million on their new smart card. And what's the difference? It's blue. That's it. Same provider. Just 22 people in my electorate are utilising that technology according to evidence given and estimates. Now that doesn't seem that smart to me. We had around 7,000 on the previous CDC. And at the same time as dealing with challenges around welfare dependence, we've got an unemployment rate under 4% and a resources sector that is breaking all records. So why is Labor reaching for the immigration bucket? Why not the Australian options bucket? Housing prices are out of reach for many. Rental costs are through the roof or simply unavailable. And Labor's solution is a, reportedly to bring an immigration tidal wave across this financial year and next so that Australia will experience the biggest two-year population surge in its history. Where will they live? What jobs will they take? What impact will this massive increase in population have on services already stretched thin in healthcare and education? How will local government provide them with essential services, land for housing, and where will the materials to build those houses come from given we've already got current shortages? Now many will be low or semi-skilled workers who end up in unionised workplaces. Some will end up on welfare. And this is not a reflection on those individuals. Our country has been built from the back of hard-working immigrants. It is just a statement of fact based on what's happened previously. Regional Australia is desperate for people desperate. But why would you move to an area if it can't provide for your basic needs? The regions, in my view, is the heart of our nation. It sets the nation's psyche, the way we think about ourselves. It's embedded in our nation's history. And yet the overwhelming majority of new immigrants will go to Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane. <coughs> now, pre-COVID in 2017, 193,800 people migrated from overseas to those three capitals alone. That is the equivalent of the Queensland regional city of Townsville moving to eastern capitals in just one year. Imagine how many houses, schools, hospitals, roads will be needed annually for 190,000 people. No matter 900,000. 900,000. And you're wondering why as a city resident you're spending more time stuck in city traffic, can't find childcare or school places and seen constantly hitting roadblocks on local services. Now, among those immigrants are the specialists and doctors and lawyers and accountants and straight out hard workers that regional Australia desperately needs and the partners and children that go with them. And I say to all of them, if you are looking for a better quality of life, have I got a deal for you? Have I got a deal for you? In the modern world, with ever expanding technology and connectivity, how do we make living in regional Australia more attractive, maintain regional populations? and reduce unsustainable surges in city population. And why should we? Why should we? Because in my view, regional populations are essential to the nation's prosperity and the retention of Australia's values and culture. Now, no one can provide a university, an oncologist, an orthodontist and a level five hospital in every Australian town. But we can move those services closer to people who rely on them and we can grow the nation's economy at the same time. But to do that requires planning, requires strategy, requires implementation. It just, it needs action. It just needs action. Now, every single person in the room today knows what drives the location of the Australian population. You all know. It is jobs, jobs, jobs and jobs and communities of interest. People go where the work is. They go where services are provided and a lifestyle exists that suits them and their family. So the question for me, this is a federal member of the government as an MP. Do I think we have the levers to drive population location without clunky and unworkable regulation? Well, the answer is, of course we do. The government of the day controls the largest budget in Australia at over $600 billion annually. 
the taxpayer employs over 2 million public servants. Now, I had that quadruple checked because that didn't sound right to me, but according to the ABS, that is spot on. The taxpayer employs 2 million public servants. Defence has enormous resources and radical changes can be reined around tariffs, taxation, zoning, superannuation, take your pick. The two regional deals delivered by the coalition were a glimmer of hope and opportunity because technology now allows individuals to work from practically anywhere in many instances. So clearly, governments can shift the population if they have the will. So once a decision is made that we have the capability, the next question becomes where and why and how much and who's paying. So today, and like others before me, I'm calling for a national population policy, a plan to take to the next federal election, a policy that determines where Australia's next major cities will be located, a policy that takes pressure off our cities and city residents, a national vision for regional growth and city relief. Now you can call it a contest, you can call it a competition, but it is a detailed and clear-eyed assessment to identify existing towns that have what's needed to become a major city with all of the services. Where is it in Australia that you have sufficient affordable land for expansion? Where is it that is potentially over-invested in supporting infrastructure for water and sewerage, transport connectivity, or potentially for connectivity by air, road, rail, or sea? Where is sufficient water supply to last into the next century? Now, the mainstream view is that regional development policies should not seek to reverse depopulation, but to accelerate growth, both economic and population. And I'm advised that my alma mater, the Queensland University of Technology, developed a carrying capacity dashboard online tool back in 2014, and it suggests that Australia can manage a population of around 40 million, of around 40 million. Now, common sense would tell you infrastructure development in regional areas will be substantially more cost effective than tearing down expensive city housing to build congestion busting inf infrastructure. So the question is this, do we want Australia to be a nation of three cities of four million plus or 12 cities of one million plus? Now, unfortunately, under federal labour, the infrastructure pipeline that we had in place as a coalition government is now under review. And now everyone watching and here knows that is code for gone. All right, it's gone. Now, the advent of modern technology, communications, transport and logistics improvement, regional connectivity means the world as we know it is rapidly changing. Technology should be the great equaliser for regional Australia. Video conferencing, remote health and education, access to a wealth of information, drones, automation, the list goes on and on and on. But as the former leader of the Nationals, Warren Trust, said to me many, many times, the upgraded road, bridge, port or airport has unfortunately become the road out of town. And Australians are siloing to the nation's capitals. Why? Well, because they can. <laughs> because they can because there is work and services and a new lifestyle. Now in a free nation, every individual has the absolute right to live where they choose, to live their life, and raise their families in a way that they see fit. But we must also consider the national interest and what is best for the people of this nation. Now much of Australia's prosperity comes from the regions. ABARES estimated in 21, the farm gate value in ag alone was $66 billion. Resources exports, according to the Resources Energy Quarterly, which I know well, it's around $460 billion, $460 billion, up from 246 in the middle of COVID. No one else can do that, no one. Coal is now our largest resource export at $130 billion plus, and the 30% of Australian people that currently choose to make their regions their home are doing their fair share and more when it comes to delivering for the national economy. So as policymakers, should we continue to allow nature to take its course when it comes to the location of Australia's population? Do we stand by and allow the stripping from Australia's regions of the people and services it needs and the massive growth in our cities which directly affects their livability? Or do we make a stand? In Queensland, Labor government systematically closed maternity services in regional Queensland. They just took them away. And state Labor continue to drive up the price of energy and water, which makes some industries like the sugar industry, particularly where there's no low rainfall, practically unviable. Now I'm naturally suspicious of anything that a Labor government does. But the damage these decisions have had on regional communities is deplorable, absolutely deplorable. In recent years, the regions have lost banking services, railways, departmental staff, medical services, even local grocery stores. And in contrast, the cities have had massive unplanned increases in population. 
We need to invest in the regions that produce so much with so few in a bid to attract and retain more people to those areas. But we also need every Australian to contribute. We need everyone that is capable of work to be at work, making a contribution, making a difference, building this nation, not just a few. How is it possible that we have 512,000 unemployed Australians, but some regional areas are still desperate for labour, skilled and unskilled? That without working holiday makers and skilled migrant visas, many businesses will close their doors. Now, while it, whilst this is a simplistic assessment of a complicated issue, the questions are obvious. It is very clear that policy settings are not giving everyday Australians the results they deserve. It has been the creeping death of opportunity over a long period of time for Australian youth. So what can be done? Well, like the great reformists uh, in previous governments, Howard, Keating, Hawke, we've all got to make some tough decisions. And while I recognise tough decisions take political capital, and there are limited opportunities to do anything but oppose from opposition, I believe, I truly believe, the Australian people want a vision for the future. And if our current or previous leaders can't or won't provide it, someone has to demand that action. We cannot afford to simply continue to slide into an abyss an abyss where a generation of Australians are being lost to welfare dependence. So let's look quickly at some numbers. A single parent with three kids under eight receives welfare payments and rental of assistance of around $2,055 a fortnight, plus the additional benefit of a healthcare card, cheaper childcare or kindergarten, tax free. A couple with three kids under eight with one parent working on minimum wage gets around $3,055 a fortnight with wages and government assistance combined before taxes. How can this continue? How can this continue? We have to act so all Australians contribute in a meaningful way to make this nation better. In summary, ladies and gentlemen, I'm calling for the possible to become certain. What some believe unlikely, I call the achievable, the necessary and the must be. A long-term vision for our nation, affordable, reliable energy with a new industry thrown into boot, nuclear getting serious about multi-generational welfare and the future of our children, and a population plan that works for all Australians now and into the future. Now, delivering that vision comes with an added bonus, the delivery of services to those that choose a regional life, and a manageable level of growth for our cities, tough policies that deliver outcomes not ideals for those caught in the welfare trap, and finally, a fair go for those that work hard by putting more money in work in Australians' pockets when compared to being on welfare. Will these outcomes for our nation come to be a reality? Well, that will be determined by each individual politician's will to succeed, being stronger than their desperation to just hold on. And I believe the Australian people are desperate for a long-term vision for our nation. And for that vision to be successful, it must include regional Australia, not just the cities. It is the engine room of our export industry and the backbone of our national economy. That lies in the regions. Australians are tired of being told what they can say, think and do by idealists. Idealists that tolerate no dissent to their worldview and in fact attack viciously those who might disagree with them. Australians don't demand a lot, but they deserve much. They work hard, they play hard and they take financial risks every day. They employ and build businesses. And regional Australians have been at the heart of our nation's public identity for more than two centuries. It is not an Akubra hat, a big belt buckle and an RM William boots that make a person an Australian. It's determination. It is a will to succeed. It is a resilience in the face of all challenges that confront them. That is what makes Australians unique in the world. And it's past time that those in public life act for their long-term benefit. And for me, for one, while my electorate continues to support me, I won't leave that life without continuing the fight for their interests. We must plan, implement and deliver a path to a better Australia. Thank you so much. Yeah. I saw you looking at the watch there, Jared. I was a bit worried I was over. No, I'm a little bit over. No, you're fine. You're absolutely fine. So we come to, um, thanks for a very lively speech. Um, so we come to questions and discussion. Everyone's got to keep their comments short. Can I just go back to, I mean, there are a number of things in your paper, obviously, but immigration, as you know, um, Australia's most successful political conservative governments, Robert Menzies, uh, in terms of the time they spent in office, Malcolm Fraser, John Howard, they all had high levels of immigration 
and they were, as you know, coalition governments. They were supported by originally the Country Party, now, now the Nationals. You're proposing a change, but you also mentioned in your paper that a lot of your rural supporters, they want immigration to, to make their farms work. So how do you have a situation where some people want immigration, including some of your own people, but you're wary about it because you think it'll go to the wrong place? Yes, of course. So I think that one of the challenges here is what's the balance point? Of course we need more people and we need immigration. That, that's been our history. But the idea and the numbers that have been floating around recently vary, uh, as I'm sure Jared would agree. I've seen as high as one and a half million by the time you have um, natural increases plus what's been suggested by Labor. So what I'm suggesting is we need to identify what it is we can manage in a short period of time and where do they go? Because the reality is unless we plan to build regional cities, and it's the reason I made the point about what do we want? Do we want 12, 14, 15, 1 million person cities? Or do we want everybody to live in Melbourne and Sydney and Brisbane until eventually the coast just merges together in a few hundred years time? Now, I, I think there are locations in Australia which make a lot of sense to identify as locations to build, and governments can do this, right? They've done this before. Uh, you move big departments, you build defence bases, there's a lot going on around AUKUS. Uh, there's an incredible uh, amount of infrastructure work being done for defence, particularly in the far north. But the challenge for the far north as a former Northern Australian minister, in my view, is always one around people. Uh, you, you just can't get enough people. So for them, automation is the big way forward for them. Uh, one of the things I tried to do as a Northern Australian minister, but it eventually got announced by uh, Prime Minister Albanese, uh, there's a thing called Hyper One. And I'd spoken with Bevan Slattery, the proponent, a number of times. And his proposal is effectively new links uh, from offshore for communications and strappers through the centre. And in his view, he could land terabyte delivery into regional centres for data. And you can then bounce off the back of a thing called SBAS, Satellite Based Augmentation Systems, which means you can actually automate to within survey quality for distance. Now, for the non-technical people, that means you could run an automated bus, truck, car, pick whatever you like, up and down uh, within a couple of centimetres accuracy. Uh, and it means in the far north where you do have challenges with weather, with people, with accommodation, everything else, it is a lifesaver for them. But they can't do it until the technology gets there. So they're the things I'm talking about. I noticed you said uh, we should all be working, but I worked for 43 years for the Attorney General's Department. I can assure you I'm not going to work another day no. longer. I've had it. What I find interesting though, and I know a lot of land clearing has gone on because I know people in Victoria have had windmills put on their land and they used to produce potatoes for you know McDonald's and all these sort of people. What I'm interested in is where, with the money trail, where is it going with solar panel providers and windmill providers? Uh, so two points. Firstly, thank you for your contribution. 40 years as a taxpayer, that's great. <laughs> we need more like that. <laughs> Uh, secondly, I meant to change that to say things, things like that, but I forgot. Um, you've got a couple of challenges. Many of them are investment bodies, investment bankers, and you know they're doing it because they make a return. They're not doing these investments because they can provide affordable and reliable electricity for Australia and its people. They do it because it makes money. And it makes money because they have, firstly, an unfair advantage around you know, what was put in place with the RET. Uh, secondly, they're taken into the market early so they can actually bid in zero or negative dollars if they need to uh, and thirdly the challenge in terms of con connectivity and i think if, if i've got a little bit of time here jared i want to make a couple of points here australia has traditionally been a you know large location generator with the spider web that gets to everybody else and now they're talking about being distributed generation with generation everywhere that you then move around i don't know if anyone's noticed how big this country is right it's a really big place and every time you need to transmit something further and further and further, A, it costs more. There's a regulated rate of return, which from memory is 5 or 5.5%. Five so there is a guaranteed rate of return on all new transmission to the people that own it, paid for by guess who? All of you. So I think these are the challenges. It's one of the reasons I'm such a big supporter of nuclear, because it is base load. You could utilise existing uh, brownfield retired coal assets where they are, because the transmission's already there, depending on a lot of other things. You still need to do geotech assessment, make sure there's not earthquake risk and everything else that goes along with it. So that, that's a long way down the track. Uh, but in terms of follow the money, uh, last time I looked, I think 
it was around $46 billion of support from electricity users and taxpayers into the industry, and that was quite some time ago. So I come back to the point about South Korea's nuclear. Four 1,350 megawatt stations for 18 billion US. You would have had those. Yeah. Right, so rough, rough and ready, that was about where Liddell was that just closed, 1,350 megawatts by four. Yes, thank you, Keith. I'm from the Central West, and I, uh, everybody want you know we we look forward to people coming out. Uh, we do have challenges in Lithgow, for example. You've got uh, Mount Piper's power station yep. has was built to be duplicated. It never has been. Now uh, we've got the Chinese Power and Light Company owns it. They're getting money from the taxpayer for um, for, for, for twenty. I think it was twenty million for hydro that's never going to work and yet where and and the people of Lithgow would love to have now they're they're pro pro nuclear and pro coal so how can you stop but the Chinese power and light company won't, won't allow it because it's not to their benefit okay. so I, I I'll make a couple of points I've been in lots of power stations in a previous life and I'm trying to think of one where it wasn't designed to be extended and have more uh, I think nearly all of them were designed that way in multiple bays so that, that's not unusual. Uh, the fact that it hasn't come off, that's not unusual either. So th these are some of the challenges. But in terms of investment, you know, we've, we've got a very strong foreign investment review board process in Australia. We, we genuinely do. Uh, but we also have one where we need foreign investment. Now, I'm not going to argue about where it should or shouldn't come from, uh, but I just happened to have been at a committee hearing yesterday. And if I can recall this correctly, uh, the top six investors was the US, the UK, Singapore, China was in there, but it was only you know at four or five. So there are a lot of people that invest in this country, but guess what? It's because they A, want a return, and B, they want stability. And if you look at what's happening in the resources sector in particular right now, Queensland's got the highest taxes and royalty on the coal sector in the world. Uh, BHP came out yesterday, and along with Anglo, I think, and said that their investments here are basically finished. Uh, and they've already knocked a $2 billion project on the head. Now, all of these projects, have a life cycle where they'll come to the end and they, if they can't expand or move on, well, it closes because you run out of resource. And those pipelines are very, very long. And when you have a big gap in them, uh, that is good for nobody, but particularly Australia. Um, there's a question. Just, yeah, there's a question here, is there? Yeah. Um, in terms of developing regional cities, how much is this a state matter and how much a federal matter? And, and at what point does that become the problem of who's running what? For a long period of time, I've realised everything is the Commonwealth's problem. <laughs> Almost everything. So th th there is absolutely overlap. But in terms of a, a driving the national agenda and a strategy and putting it together, well, that is the Commonwealth's role. I mean, the idea that you could bring the states to work it out themselves, I think, is unlikely. Uh, but those locations are out there, right? There, there are sites where they're genuinely designed for expansion where they do have available the, the key stuff, water, sewerage, land, roads, connectivity. Right? They're, they're the main ones in somewhere where somebody wants to live. Um, and I think there's no reason we shouldn't be identifying those and doing what we can to make it happen. Uh, it, it's how everything else gets determined. Uh, you look at a big a military base, you build it. It is an absolute driver of the economy, as is an aged care facility. Right? Large aged care centre is a massive driver of the economy. Uh, and I think it should be the Commonwealth that's driving those discussions. We need a big Florida, do we? <laughs> uh, well, it's not what I'm saying at all, but, you know. Keith, um, first Let's of all, thank you. It. Thank you for your service over, you know, your life of service. And it's a hair great. Great <laughs> inspiration to many of us. Um, I think it's been very politically expedient for governments around the world to um, go down this sort of unreliables path. Um, but a lot of polls show that people want to make the energy system greener. And then when you ask them how much they want to spend on it, the typical answer is about 100 bucks a year. I can tell you exactly how much it is. <laughs> yeah, well, you probably know better than I do. Um, at what point does the penny drop with people as power bills go up 25% next year and continues on and on? It's a really good question. Uh, and off the top of my head, I think the research, it was 180. Uh, anything over $180 a year, they're out, like 95% opposed uh, in terms of you know who wants to pay. So it's good while you feel warm and fuzzy. 
but, but the point I want to make here, whether it's the carbon tax, whether it's the voice, whether it's everything, pick, pick a tough policy. Uh, the researchers go out and they come back and they say, oh, you, you couldn't possibly say no to the voice because, you know, 65% in the first poll said that they love it. Well, our job is to make the case, right? If you, if you want to stand by your values, you've got to be willing to go out and fight for them. And if you don't make the case, well, everybody thinks it's warm and fuzzy and wonderful because that's, that's how it is and it works. Uh, and it's one of the things that, you know, I've always been, um, I won't say forceful, but determined to, to make sure that, you know, decisions are made on facts. Uh, the, the, the current business in politics, a lot of it is about feelings. You look at the last election. Uh, you know, they felt we were bad. I think they might have a different view now, hopefully. Um, but that, that's the nature of the business. But, but our job as the talking heads, we, we've got to make the case. And the best way to make the case is with straight out facts and pure numbers that people understand. Uh, and it's something I try to do every, almost every time I speak. So you make a really good point. But if you're in politics, you've got to be willing to stand on your dig Right. This is this is why I talk about values. There's no good talking about values. You've got to stand by them. It's very easy to talk about them. Before we go to the next question here, just talking about standing on your digs. And you've been very lively and emphatic tonight and very clear. But some of your colleagues in the joint party room on the Liberal side probably wouldn't be all that happy. Not all of them, some of them. So how do you handle this in coalition? So the, the great thing about our parties, in my view, is we're the parties of freedom, right? Freedom and choice. And there will always be individuals who have a different view and they're allowed to. But if you look at the opposition, if they step out of line, they get disendorsed. Did anyone notice that very short story briefly on AUKUS about how, you know, four, five, six Labor MPs were unhappy about AUKUS and being signed up that had a retraction within two hours? Uh, that's because they get a phone call that says you'll be disendorsed from running the seat next time. We don't do that. And to be honest, I think that's better for our democracy. And, and my job and their job is to put forward their case. Uh, and I'll give him a shout out. I'm going to give a shout out to my mate, Julie and Lisa. Now, Julie and I are opposed on The Voice. We're on far ends of the spectrum, right? But I respect his view and I understand why he wants to do what he's doing. And he is entitled to do it because that is part of the great values and traditions of our parties, the, the ability to have a different decision, have a different discussion. And at the end of the day, the majority rules. Uh, if I look at the net zero debate in the Nationals, for example, now this is reported, I'm not breaking any rules, um, that was supported by one lousy vote, one. Uh, and you know, I don't agree because I don't want people to pay more. The, the people that I represent, they just can't afford it. And if, I, if I remember the numbers correctly, they, they have a per capita income of around $35,000 a year. Can you imagine surviving on $35,000 a year? An increase in their power bill of $50 matters. The idea that someone will tell them they have to buy a battery powered car that costs 65 grand when their current one is six and they can hardly put the fuel in it, it matters. Uh, and I think it's one of the reasons they send me to Canberra because you know, no one sends me there to sit around nodding my head in furious agreement. Yeah. Keith, uh, Ben Davies uh, from the Minerals Council of Australia. Um, my organisation, as you know, represents uranium producers and has a view on nuclear power, but one of them told me an interesting piece of trivia recently, that in Commonwealth Territory at Jarvis Bay, there actually still exists the foundations for a nuclear power station that were put there in the 1960s, but then cancelled by the then Commonwealth Government. Is that one option to fast-track nuclear power in Australia? Well, firstly, that's true. Um, Secondly, there's some things going on there that I can't talk about, but it's not a nuclear reactor, right? For anyone that's watching on Zoom, it's not a nuclear reactor. Um, but there's there's some proposals which are, I don't know that they're public yet, so I, I just I can't talk about that. Uh, but yes, you can do things on Commonwealth land, but in my view, you've got, you've got to bring people with you, right? And, and I think Australian people they're adult enough to have this conversation. They, they genuinely are, but they need to be informed. The most informed community on radioactive waste in the country is in Rowan uh, Ramsey's electorate in Grey at Kimber, where for the last five or six years, they've been debating whether they have a low level radioactive waste facility. One that's taken 46 years and 16 ministers to get to. And they said 63% yes, and they're still fighting, but they are, they're informed, right? They know more about that stuff than most Australians. So I, I think if we, we have the debate, we go to them and it's, it's up to the people, right? They'll determine if they want to do this. But it's pretty straightforward. If you want zero emissions technology, if that's what floats your boat, that's fine. But if you want it to be reliable and affordable and work, 
and work all the time. As a, as a former farmer, I can tell you, you don't want to be looking out the window to see if you can put the roast on. Right? It just won't fly. Just for our people who may not be familiar, Kimber's in South Australia. South Australia, yes. Okay. Keith, um, a lot of us are very despondent about what is actually happening in Australia with this government, in particular Australia's sovereignty with Japan's concern about our yeah. gas supply. Um, we don't hear enough from you. You're a very reassuring voice and unless you listen to Sky News, I don't hear from you. How uh, can we get greater exposure? Because I think a lot of conservative people need this reassurance and need to get behind you. I, I, Unfortunately, in my own defence, humble opposition backbenchers don't get a lot of calls for ABC Breakfast uh, or the Today Show. But I'm happy to go on for anyone that's watching. Uh, look, I, and I am doing my best to be, to be honest. But my priority is always the people I represent, right? I've got 121,000 voters who are really doing it tough and they expect me to fight for them and they are always the first priority. But the national interest always sits very, very high. Uh, it's the only reason I'm in politics. I, I, I could have stayed in business. I would have made far more money, yeah. wouldn't have this, yeah. my wife would be happier. Not that she's unhappy now, I hope she's not watching. Um, so look, you make good points but, and I've said this to groups before and I'll say it again now, if you want politics and the parliament to be better, send better people, right? But you have to convince them to run, you have to pre-select them, you have to show up at the pre-selection, you have to be there and get the ones that you think are right for what you believe in. Uh, and Australia is a really big country. And it's, and it's a patchwork quilt, right? What works in the inner city suburb of Melbourne is very, very different to what happens with Phil Thompson in Herbert in Townsville, for example. Uh, now, I love Phil to death, but he is a typical North Queenslander. Uh, he'll, he'll usually start a sentence with a curse word and have another one in the middle and end it with that, and it'll have about <laughs> four words in it. But that's great. I love that, right? That, that's, that's what they're like. Um, so you need the proposal that people can go with you on. You need a proposal that the opposition can't. And if you look at what's happening with gambling ads at the moment, you know, I, I absolutely beat my head against the wall trying to get that in place some years ago while we were in government. And this is about advertising for gambling during, you know, hours when kids are watching. Uh, Peter came out with an his maiden speech, as a maiden speech, in his um, budget and reply. And of course, Labor's now implemented, basically. So we've seen announcements, I think, today, Jared, from memory. So it's a good idea. They picked it up. That's great. We'll get the outcome. But in terms of winning elections, you need things they can't go with you. Thank you for your stimulating discussion. Instead of covering good land with solar panels, which you pointed out is not really a very bright thing to do, why don't we look more at carbon sequestration? It's a natural form of carbon capture, but it just doesn't seem to get any political interest on, on either side of politics. And yet, you know, carbon capture going side by side with nuclear could make a huge difference. Uh, we are on a unity ticket, an absolute unity ticket. So the, the CSIRO report that I mentioned in the speech from last, I think it's last November, actually identifies all of the existing protocols in Australia for carbon capture and how you measure that and everything else and what the methodology is. It does an assessment of how much land you need for how much offset. It does a very unrealistic one and then a realistic one. The only thing that has gigatons of storage is CCS, uh, particularly if it's in a depleted gas field in one where the existing infrastructure is already there. Uh, and you know, I, I know a lot of our offshore providers are looking at this right now because the pipelines are there, the pumps go in, everything else is available. It comes down to firstly the cost, how much people are willing to pay. Um, but secondly, you've got so much noise out there. Madeleine King actually spoke about this uh, at the World Resources Conference in Brisbane yesterday. And the point that I made is she's on the right path, but she's the only Labor Minister that's on it, right? Nobody else is there. And it is the only solution because and these are numbers are very rough and ready, so please don't hold me completely to them. The safeguard mechanism and the 215 big emitters have to get from memory 200 million tonnes of CO2 reduction or offsets or sequestration by 2030. Now, unless you're going to take out half of Australia's agriculture, because if you're not putting it on cleared or partially cleared land, it doesn't have the benefit and doesn't meet the criteria. You're not getting there. And even then, you're still not getting there. So you've only got 426 million hectares, roughly, of ag land. And you imagine if you took out half your ag, well, don't we want to grow food? But I think this is the point. So you're spot on. I think CCS is the only opportunity, but unfortunately, Chris Bowen is absolutely opposed. He won't do it.
So finally, because we've pretty well run out of time, um, so your priorities are, I mean, just talk us a bit before you get on to your priorities, just how difficult it is, because you mentioned this proposal to um, put away low-level nuclear waste, mm -hmm. which is, as you know, is, is clothing and boots and helmets and whatever, and that took, I think you said, 47, 46, years. 46 years. And 16 ministers. And it's still 16 ministers. You were the second last one. Madeline has it now. Yeah, yeah Madeline King has it now. So, and where are we at? We're not quite there yet, are we? So, it's through, the legislation is through the parliament. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's currently under appeal for the second, third, fourth time uh, on a review of my decision. Uh, I don't expect that there'll be any challenges with that, but they are working their way through it, which just drags it out and makes it harder. And I think the best people, the, the best thing for the people in Kimber is we just get on with this thing, right? Because it has been very divisive. It's been very difficult. Uh, and I really appreciate the fact they've stuck this out because they could have quite easily just walked walked away from it. But we need this facility. So anyone that you know that needs treatment for cancer has a PET scan. It produces low-level waste that has to be stored and Lucas Heights is going to run out probably by about 2030 in terms of storage space. We just need to build it. So in terms of how do you make things happen, uh, I'm a pretty practical guy, Jared, as you know, yeah. and I discovered very early on, probably in my first term, if you want something to happen in Parliament, there's only a few ways to make it happen. You go out and you find 76 people that will vote for it in the House, and you go and get your 39 in the Senate, and you get them all to sing Kumbaya and hold hands, and that <laughs> takes a very, very long time. Or you wedge them all on things that they can't manage. Or you run a very, very large media circus and you get uh, you get the tidal wave <coughs> of support from the public. You get critical mass. And then all of a sudden, all of my colleagues are saying, why, why are we getting these calls about, you know, pick an issue um, when we're going to have to fix this and people move? Now, some of those methodologies I know my colleagues don't always appreciate, but if it's the right thing to do, it's the right thing to do. Many thanks. Thanks so much. So um, many thanks to um, just hang on a second. <laughs> just <laughs> so um, many thanks to Keith Petra. Uh, what I can say today is you certainly get your message across. We see you on Sky News, rarely on the hear you on or see you on the ABC, but we see you on Sky News, and we're seeing you tonight. And you can certainly get a message across, and it's um, it's a great great achievement to be able to do that. Thanks for a strong speech, and we'll have you back again in the future, um, maybe when you're next in government. Well, certainly then, whenever that is, but possibly before. But for tonight, well done. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.